Oh, wow, damn, man, it's pizza film school About to learn about the movies, man, whoa, it's real cool And who else better to tell me about why certain shots go together Than the best ever Aunt and Joe is like Kobe and Shaq And Aunt is obviously Shaq But forget who's taller than blockbuster ballers And now let's get ready for class Where we at saying Hey yo, it's the Russo Show Hey yo, it's the Russo Show Hey yo, it's the Russo Show Hey everyone, welcome to the season finale of Pizza Film School And this is a very special finale Today we'll be talking about the movie of the week Back to the Future, directed by Robert Zemeckis <laughs> Joining me is my brother Anthony, Chris Marcus, and Steve McFeely, who we affectionately refer to as Eminem, and our very, very special guest, the brilliant screenwriter of Back to the Future, Mr. Bob Gale. Bob, welcome. This is truly an honor. We're all very excited to be talking to you. Hey, thank you guys for having me aboard, and I'm always happy to talk to anybody about writing. Great. Well, part of what the show does is we try to support local pizzerias tonight, I am eating from Lamora's Pizza, which is typically served out of a mobile wood-fired oven here in Los Angeles. But since the pandemic started, they have organized a frozen pizza delivery system that actually uses the power of pizza for good. With every order, they match that with a pizza donation to organizations, families, and individuals who are in need right here in Los Angeles. So please try Lamora's Pizza. It's fantastic. Let us know where you got it from. Was Geno's East in Sherman Oaks, and it no longer is. Ghost Pizza Kitchen on Melrose, which is swell. I don't have pizza with me right now, but I want to put in a plug because we've been so local to Los Angeles pizzerias. Steve, Chris, Joe, and I spent many years in Atlanta making Captain America Civil War, Infinity War, and Endgame. And there is an amazing pizzeria there called Amatza in the Inman Park area on Edgewood Avenue. They make a vegan picante there, which has a little cashew cheese, and it's very spicy. Very satisfying pizza. I highly recommend it. Bob, did we get you some pizza? I'm not doing pizza tonight because an actor once told me never eat on camera. So, <laughs> was, I'm not doing that, but uh, yeah. hey, I got to put in a plug for my hometown. St. Louis has a particular kind of thin crust pizza. Notably, the most famous chain is called Emo's. You can get it online, have it sent, flash frozen. My wife and I add our own extra onion and sausage and tomatoes and whatever, but it's a good way to start. And hey, Steve, I was so excited when I heard you on another show talking that there was a Geno's East in Sherman Oaks because I love Chicago deep dish too. So I will definitely have to check that out. It's good to hear you talk about your St. Louis pizza because I think pizza like movies makes up a lifelong impression on you when you're young. As we have enjoyed this movie. So we'll do a little backstory on the film. This was directed by Mr. Zemeckis. Action! Released on July 3rd, 1985. Screenplay by yourself and Mr. Zemeckis. Score by our dear friend, Alan Silvestri, and starring Michael J. Fox. To get a little bit of background for everyone, Bob, this was a project that couldn't get off the ground until the success of Romancing the Stone. Is that correct? Will you take 375 in traveler's checks? American Express? Of course. Not a deal. Right. We wrote two drafts of this project at Columbia Pictures, and it was put in a turnaround. We got over 40 rejections. People just said, hey, time travel movies don't make any money. Or if it's comedy, we want something raunchier. We want stripes. We want porkies. We don't want this. Chicks dig me because I rarely wear underwear. And when I do, it's usually something unusual. Another question was, yeah, this is great. This is great. How is Steven Spielberg involved? And we'd say, well, he's not. And they said, oh, well, maybe it's not that good. (laughs) Spielberg actually was a fan of the script from the beginning, from when he read the second draft. I just think the movie is is, is so rich in story and and, and so rich in in, in, in sort of, you know, occurrence that uh, I really liked it. I, I mean, it was all in the script, too. But Bob and I had been in business with him on three pictures. I Want to Hold Your Hand, Used Cars, both of which Bob directed, and uh, 1941, which Stephen directed. And none of these pictures did terribly well at the box office, even though I'm really proud of all three of them. So Stephen said, I'll come on board Back to the Future. And this was in 1981. And Bob said, hey, Stephen, if you know, I'm flattered, that's great. But if I do another picture with you and it bombs, people are going to say, oh, he's the guy that only gets to direct when his pal Stephen gives him a job and my career will be over. Stephen thought a minute and said, well, yeah, you're probably right about that. But uh, come back to me if you change your mind. Meanwhile, we're running around dealing with independent producers. We get half the money raised. Zemeckis and I take another job. We develop a gangster 
monster movie at ABC Motion Pictures, and then they market tested the concept out of existence. Six weeks into pre-production, they canceled it. And Bob was so depressed, he said, I'm just going to direct the next decent script that comes along. That was Romancing the Stone. Turns out to be a terrific movie, which, by the way, 20th Century Fox didn't think it was very terrific when they first saw it. And Bob had been groomed and was going to take on the movie Cocoon. And basically, they fired him from it because they thought Romancing the Stone was crap. Just get your ass off my boat. You believe this? And uh, take your embarrassing beach towel with you. So anyway, he's got a big hit movie, Romancing the Stone. He, the one movie he wants to make more than anything else, Back to the Future. He says, I got all these, my new fair weather friends who want to be in business with me because Romancing the Stone is a hit. Let's take Back to the Future to the guy that we always believed in. Let's take it back to Steven. This film was about time. Timing sometimes is everything. Steven just set up Amblin Entertainment at Universal. And Steven said, yeah, let's set this up through Amblin. I'm going to get Sid Scheinberg, CEO of MCA, to read this. And uh, we were the very first Amblin Entertainment hmm. movie. Can I ask you, talk a little bit about where the idea came from? Oh, uh, sure. The idea is often ideas, they hit you when you're not expecting them. I remember it vividly. I was standing on the edge of my toilet, hanging a clock. The porcelain was wet. I slipped, hit my head on the edge of the sink. And when I came to, I had a revelation, a vision, a picture in my head, a picture of this. This is what makes time travel possible. I was in St. Louis, Missouri, my hometown, promoting used cars, as a matter of fact. I was staying with my parents. I was digging around in my parents' basement, and I came across my dad's high school yearbook. I attended the exact same high school that my dad did. So I said, hey, this is kind of cool. I wonder what my high school was like in 1940. So I'm thumbing through this, and my dad is the president of his graduating class. I had no idea. Get out of town. I didn't know you did anything creative. And so here I am. I'm looking at this picture of my dad, and he's looking very straight. He's not smiling right now. Geez, was my dad the same kind of guy that the president of my high school was? My high school class president, he's one of these rah-rah school spirit guys. I just couldn't stand the guy. And then I said, well, if I was in high school with my dad, would I have even been friends with this guy? Maybe we were adopted. Boom. That's when the lightning bolt hit. And I said, okay, there's that time travel movie that Zemeckis and I have been struggling trying to figure out what a hook could be for it. What if a kid went back in time and went to high school with his dad? Came back to California, told the idea to Zemeckis. He went nuts for it. He said, yeah, wouldn't it be great if your mom went to the same high school and after her telling you for years that she never did anything with a boy when she was in high school, she's like the class slut. That's a great idea. I'd love to park. Huh. Marty, I'm almost 18 years old. It's not like I've never parked before. What? And we just got cooking on this thing, and we said, we got to make this move. So That's you had that. already been noodling, in theory, a time travel movie. Correct. The idea of this particular time travel movie, this concept, because there was no story, we were fascinated by the futures that we don't have. You know, mm -hmm. the future is predicted at the 1939 World's Fair. The future is predicted at the 1964 World's Fair. The future that we saw in all these popular mechanics and all the science fiction magazines and Superman comics, all this stuff with the flying cars and cities under the sea and all this great stuff. And we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could make a movie and put that vision of the future on the screen? And so that was really what we were trying to figure out. Decades later, it comes to pass in Sky Captain in the World of Tomorrow which was really like that. We just were fascinated by the visuals and fascinated by the idea that there was all this technology that people believed would happen and never did. But we never could figure out a way into that story. And it was called, at that time, Professor Brown Visits the Future. So something did carry over. I mean, like yes. you, you, you had yeah. at least a character. If yeah, yeah, we had a character. And so in those first two drafts of Back to the Future, when Marty comes back to 1982 or 83, because that's when we wrote the it had to be 30 years. The future that he came to was this sort of Norman Bell Jetty's flying car future. It was actually one of the things that people had a real problem with. I mean, we thought it would be cool mm -hmm. to live in a future like this where all these social problems were solved and all these technology problems were solved. But people would read this script and say, gee, it's kind of a tragedy, isn't it? That this kid ends up in this world that he doesn't have any real connection to, any real concept to, even though his parents are still his parents. And, you know, dad stood up to Biff and Actually, in those early drafts, George became a prize fighter, believe it or not. Because uh, if he could knock out Biff, he could knock out anybody. It's 
Tell me a little bit about how you and Bob met each other. Bob and I were classmates at USC Film School. We met in the fall of 1971. We were among about eight or 10 undergraduate students in a class that was largely graduate students. The grads were all kind of stuffy and into art films and French New Wave and Jean-Luc Godard. Bob and I liked Walt Disney movies and Dirty Harry and James Bond. And we came to California to make Hollywood movies. You could ask yourself a question. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? Bob and I kind of connected and bonded over the fact that The Great Escape was one of the movies that made a gigantic impression on us to such an extent that we both owned the original soundtrack album. Bob was the first person I ever met that had that album and vice versa. So we knew we had a lot in common. He wanted to be a director, I wanted to be a writer. And we just said, hey, let's storm Hollywood together. And so you guys started writing scripts together for Bob to direct. Yeah, and we started our first script that we worked on together was even before we got out of college. I had this idea for a low budget vampire movie. The idea was that female vampires were in a bordello. They lived upstairs of a funeral home and at daytime they would sleep in the coffins in the showroom funeral home. And then at night they'd go upstairs and they'd be the prostitutes and guys would come to this bordello. It got made 17 years later as Tales from the Crypt presents Bordello of Blood. I do not recommend it. It's a terrible movie. We were rewritten and rewritten and rewritten, so I kind of disowned it. But that moral of the story is don't ever throw anything away. Yes. Yeah. Good, and I, I need to ask you, you mentioned earlier that uh, used cars in 1941 weren't well received, but just speaking for Joe and I, we loved those movies, watched them many, many times. Mm -hmm. Would you just talk briefly about how you came to those two stories? Sure. Used cars, audiences that saw it absolutely loved it. We just couldn't get people to go to the movies because when it came out, it was like a week or two after Airplane came out. So Airplane was the movie everybody's saying, oh, you want to go see a comedy? You got to go see Airplane. Well, look, Jeff, I got to get some customers on this lot, man. Yeah, I got to yeah. move some of this iron. I got to yeah, make some it... fast cash. I mean it. Yeah, for what? But used cars, well, let's start with 1941 because 1941 was first. We got our break from a fabulous writer by the name of John Millius. Milius, most well-known today for Apocalypse Now. He wrote and directed The Wind and the Lion, wrote and directed one of the best movies about John Dillinger called Dillinger. There's a great Netflix documentary about him simply called Milius. He was a USC alum. When we're hustling, trying to get a job, you know, we're looking up everybody that we could think of who went to USC. So we went into John's office. We asked him to read this spec script that we wrote about some guys that hold up an oil company by using a Sherman tank to threaten to blow up their building in downtown Chicago. Milius loved this script because he said, boys, this is socially irresponsible. I like that. <laughs> so he'd just been finished the win in the line at MGM. He'd been given a deal to develop two screenplays with other writers and do two more pictures for MGM that he would write. So he said, I'm, I want to do for you what Francis did for me. Francis gave me my break by hiring me to do Apocalypse Now, and you guys have any ideas? And we said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, we read about this wild, crazy thing that happened in Los Angeles in early 1942. People thought that LA was under attack by the Japanese, that there was a Japanese air raid. And for five or six hours one night in February 1942, city was blacked out, and all these anti-aircraft battalions shot shells up at the sky at absolutely nothing. And we just said, there's a really weird, perverse, crazy comedy that should be done about this. Well, Millius being a history buff, he knew about that event. And he also knew that General Joseph Stilwell was stationed in California in uh, right after Pearl Harbor. So we said, let's move it to December, a week after Pearl Harbor, so we can put Stilwell on it. And we set the project up at MGM. We were coming up with these crazy ideas. Hey, let's have a dogfight down Hollywood Boulevard. Let's blow up Pacific Ocean Amusement Park. Let's have a Ferris wheel roll down the pier into the water. Let's have a Japanese sub shell the amusement park. So we came up with all these insane ideas. Madness. It's the only word to describe it. This isn't the state of California. This is a state of insanity. And Milius is telling his pal Steven Spielberg about this script that these two crazy guys he found from USC had written. Spielberg said, well, I got to read this script. This sounds insane. I got to read this. So Spielberg reads it 
And it's the kind of script that you write when you're first starting out. This is not what you're supposed to do. You know, you don't write a movie that's going to cost 15 or $20 million, which is $150 million today. You don't do that. But that's exactly what Stephen responded to because nobody was writing scripts like this. So he said, I want to direct this. And after I finish Close Encounters, that's going to be my next movie. So while Stephen was shooting Close Encounters, he flew us down to Mobile, Alabama, where he was filming. And we watched him shoot during the day. And we did rewrites for him at night. It was fun. We were living every film student's dream doing this. Hi, Steve. Hi, Bob. Let's touch one of these. <laughs> it doesn't even have a reflex viewer. In film school, did you study screenplay structure? Did you and Bob create your own process for writing scripts? Did you just write to entertain yourselves and then you wanted to make something happen? Or were you writing to an act one, a midpoint, an act two, lowest moment? What, we had a writing teacher named Erwin Blacker. Blacker was basically kind of a hack writer. He'd been the story editor on TV series called Bonanza. And I always tell people that you can learn the most about the craft of writing from hack writers mm -hmm. because they churn it out. They have to know all the rules. They know what works. They know how to push the buttons. And so we learned a tremendous amount from Erwin Blacker. Bob did not take advanced screenwriting from him. I did. The book at USC that all aspiring writers and filmmakers were supposed to read is called The Art of Dramatic Writing by a Hungarian guy named Lajos Egri. This was the Bible that screenwriters used in the 40s and the 50s. And it's really about playwriting, but I've not seen any book that more succinctly lays out the rules of drama. This was a book that we relied on. We did not get into act structure, although Agri may have talked about that a little bit, because the thing about plays, and you know, I studied Shakespeare when I was in high school, now Shakespeare's plays are five acts. You learn the rules of a Shakespeare play and you've got your rising action that rises up into act three. You got your pivotal scene and then the falling action that encompasses act four and five. And something happens in act three that makes what happens in act four and five inevitable. And in terms of well-known movies that fit into that framework, uh, The Godfather is a perfect example of that because it's right at the midpoint of the movie that when Michael Corleone kills McCluskey and Salazzo, everything else that happens in that movie is a result of that. I always say to writing students, the whole idea of an act came about from theater because they needed time to change the scenery. The actors needed time to change the costumes. They needed time to go to the bathroom. That's why you had an act break. The act break is after the equivalent of the skateboard chase. When Lorraine says, who is he, Lorraine? Where did he come from? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Boom, that's where the curtain comes. If you go see Back to the Future in concert, a uh, show with a live symphony orchestra, that's also where the movie breaks. Oh, mm -hmm. interesting. If you learn television writing in the 60s and 70s, the act break was where you put the commercial in. So we never thought in terms of, of an act structure. We always just thought in terms of how is the best way to tell this story? The three most important things in writing, in a screenplay, in a play, character, character, and character. Because if your characters aren't interesting, or if you don't get good actors to play them, you're not going to have anything. And the proof of that is the Seinfeld show, mm -hmm. right? Look how long that show ran. You know, sitcoms are a really good example of how having wonderful characters keeps the audience coming back. We go into NBC, we tell them we got an idea for a show about nothing. Exactly. They say, what's your show about? I say nothing. But there you go. I think you may have something here. You can have a movie that is thin on plot, but if the characters are great, the audience is still going to enjoy the picture. But Back to the Future is meticulous uh, yeah, in it terms is. of its plotting. It is. But we have to think about how the characters in the plot become part of each other. So, for example, here we had this idea that this kid is going to go back in time. How does he do that? We looked at the literature. We looked at other works of time travel. Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. Guy gets hit over the head. He ends up in the past. You can make a wish. You go back in the past. But Bob and I grew up in, in the 60s. We were Sputnik kids. You know, math and science. George Powell version of the time machine, 1960, made a huge impression on both of us. We said, no, it's got to be a time machine. We wouldn't believe it if somebody just had a hit over the head or made a wish. 
if we want the audience to believe this kid actually goes back in time, got to be a time machine. He goes back in time in a time machine. Where does the time machine come from? So these are all questions that you have to answer. So we thought about it and said, okay, well, is the government working on time travel? Is the Department of Defense working on it? Is TRW or North American Rockwell working on time travel? Well, yeah, they could be, but it's kind of a problem because we don't want the government to have a time machine. We don't want these big corporations to have a time machine. We don't want the military to have a time machine. That's opening up a can of worms that we don't like. So American mythology says that there is some crackpot inventor who came up with the internal combustion engine that gets 250 miles to the gallon that the oil companies won't let us have. And he also invented the reusable match and the match companies won't let us have that. That is the guy who would have invented time travel. Doc! Marty! <laughs> you made it! Yeah! Welcome to my latest experiment. This is a big one, the one I've been waiting for all my life. He would have been this eccentric, rebellious guy that didn't fit in, and he builds it in his garage. By coming up with the character of this guy, what is his sort of backstory? How is it that he was the guy that invented time travel? He is far from what the cliche scientist or even mad scientist was at the time that we did it. First of all, he's kind of a rebel and a hero because he rips off this plutonium from these terrorists. That's pretty cool. We see all this stuff in his lab. We want to meet this guy. But then there are all these other little things that some things you don't even pick up until the second or third time you see the movie. The newspaper article that you see in that opening shot. Did Doc Brown set his house on fire to collect the insurance so that he could continue financing his experiments? Did he? Well, maybe he did. <laughs> no, he That's just has a tragic story that makes me like him. One of his experiments, put it down the What are you talking about? <laughs> We, we don't answer it, but we ask it. And as right. you learn more about Doc Brown, I mean, in, in 1955, he pays off the cop. What you got under here? Don't, don't, don't touch that. Some new specialized weather sensing equipment. You uh, got a permit for that? Of course I do. And he opens up his wallet, and we cut away, but yeah. He's oh, away. wait a second. He goes, I think I have it in here somewhere. <laughs> and I just assume he had a permit in there somewhere. I assume oh. the same, Steve. We have to make you believe that Doc put the letter back together. That he oh, yeah, down, fair you know? enough. Yeah, After yeah. all this stuff, Marty yeah. says, what about all this stuff about, you know, the space-time continuum? Well, I figured what the hell. What about all that talk about screwing up future events, the space-time continuum? Well, I figured, what the hell? The audience wants him to be alive. We're, all humans are full of contradictions. It's mm -hmm. always an important thing to remember when you're writing character. When Marty says, you know, my father never stood up to Biff in his entire life. And yeah. Doc says, never. Never? No, why? What's the matter? The wheels are turning. All right. Sorry, thinking, well, maybe this kid just changed history. and Maybe I won't get in trouble if I put that letter back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're creating this character yeah. of Dr. Emmett Brown. But Dr. Brown's not the star of the movie. How did you end up making you, him the mentor figure to... But he you know, is... He's the most successful deliverer of rules in cinema history. Yes, That's true. Yes, he is. entertaining. Whoa, this is heavy. There's that word again, heavy. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull? What? They're fantastic. And he just gets more and more hyped so that you found a way to make boring the best thing in the movie. Are you telling me that this sucker is nuclear? Hey, 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 keep rolling, keep rolling there. No, 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 this sucker's electrical but I need a nuclear reaction to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity I need. But here's the thing, you guys understand this completely because you always knew who the actors were playing all these superheroes, right? Yeah. So you knew what they could do and what they couldn't do. You knew that Mark Ruffalo could probably deliver anything and do it right. Unless Selvig has figured out how to stabilize the quantum tunneling effect. Well, if he could do that, he could achieve heavy ion fusion at any reactor on the planet. Finally, someone who speaks English. Knowing that when I got to know Christopher and could see that he could just rattle this stuff off. The time continuum has been disrupted, creating this new temporal event sequence resulting in this alternate reality. English, Doc. Uh, by the time I was writing the sequels, I said, oh, okay, I can do this chalkboard scene with the alternate timelines, and Chris is going to make that work. And it was just a joy knowing, because I could hear his voice in my head every time I was writing. Writing trip, by the way. For all aspiring writers. The secret of good dialogue, one of the secrets, is to try to make the dialogue different for every character. People don't all talk the same. 
Mm -hmm. I always tell people, cast your movie in your head with the greatest actors in film history. Humphrey Bogart talks a certain way, and John Wayne talks a certain way, and Katherine Hepburn talks a certain way, and Betty Davis talks a certain way. And if you can put their voices in your head while you're writing dialogue for a particular character, you're not going to get these people to play them, but the dialogue is going to sound really good. And the characters are going to jump off the page because they have a particular way of speaking. If I can't teach you one way, I'll teach you another. But I'm going to get the job done. What was most important to you and Bob when you were starting? A concept, a character? Did you need to know the ending before you started writing? What, what, yeah, we did. We knew that the story had to be, and we struggled with this for a while, because we said, okay, kid goes back in time and encounters his parents, and then what? Okay, he interferes with his parents' first meeting, and he's got to get them together. What's interesting about that? Finally, we realized, well, what's interesting about it, the kid has his act together, and his dad is a complete screw-up. So the son has to teach his father how to be a man. I just, I wish I wasn't so scared. George, there's nothing to be scared of. All it takes is a little self-confidence. You know, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. When we got to that part, we said, okay, that's where it's got to be. George has to confront Biff, you know, become a man, rise to the occasion, and save Lorraine from Biff's evil advances. So we always knew that that's where the story had to go. By figuring out that that was the only way that the plot made sense. It helped us develop the characters so that they became interesting. And then interestingly enough, because everybody had a problem with that original ending of an altered future created by Doc Brown, because he had gotten a look at the forbidden fruit at the technology of the 80s when he was in the 50s. This is truly amazing. A portable television studio. No wonder your president has to be an actor. He's got to look good on television. We said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to change the lives of Marty's family, but the rest of the world will be the same. And for those of you who are big time travel aficionados, this is a really interesting thing that we arrived at because you've got all these great time travel stories that are cautionary tales. Somebody goes back in time with the intention of, I'm going to kill Hitler, which was a Twilight Zone episode, No Time Like the Past. Are you content with this kind of status quo? Are you satisfied with this kind of 20th century? Or Ray Bradbury, Sound of Thunder. I'm going to go back and hunt a dinosaur. And oops, I slipped, but I went back in time for my own selfish reasons. I wanted to be the guy to kill a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And as a result of the things that you do, because you're consciously aware of being back in time and in trying to make things better or trying to do something for yourself, it backfires. And the Ray Bradbury story ends up in a fascist world. And in that Twilight Zone episode, everything that this guy tries to do to fix the world backfires on him. And he ends up causing an incident in which people die by trying to prevent it. So these were all time travelers with the intention of traveling through time. Marty McFly didn't want to travel through time. He had no intention of doing this for, at all. And when he gets back in time, the only thing he wants to do is go home. And he doesn't even like the 50s. He's not interested in it. I mean, he's 17 years old. You take a 17-year-old kid from today and you send him back in time 30 years, he's not going to like it. He's going to want to come home and, uh, you know, get back on his uh, Facebook account or whatever. Get on his cell phone. Give me, give me a tab. Tab? I can't give you a tab unless you order something. All right, give me a Pepsi free. You want a Pepsi, pal? You're going to pay for it. So the idea that it was all unintended and that the results of him just trying to survive, they end up having this extra effect, making things even better because he did this only for the right reason, not for anything selfish. He was only focused on, I've got to get these two people back together. Okay, yeah, it's selfish that he wants to save his own existence, of course. But he's also saving his brother and his sister and repairing things because Doc Brown says, you gotta fix this, you gotta fix this, or the consequence could be disastrous. Of course, the enchantment under the sea dance are supposed to go to this. That's where they kiss for the first time. All right, kid. You stick to your father like glue and make sure he takes you to the dance. And then it turns out that he comes back into a family that's got their act together. I'm surprised I hadn't thought of that earlier. In lesser hands or in other drafts by other people, 
undoubtedly, there's a version where Marty McFly says, oh, my friend Doc Brown has a time machine. Why don't I go back in time and do something mischievous or interesting or selfish? But when you do that, your plot now is self-interested. It is almost a plot about shame on you for trying to mess with the future. But when you make it an accidental trip back, it's just the odyssey. It's just exactly. a guy trying to get home. The entire audience is rooting for this kid from right. the get-go. It's very smart. And so the cautionary tale is what we did in Back to the Future Part 2. Well, that's different. Yeah, that's right, right, right. Sure. <laughs> and sure enough, it has a really bad effect because he wants to make money off of sports betting. As a result, we have the Biff dystopia. Whose idea was the DeLorean? Bob Zemeckis. Give the man credit where credit is due. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're gonna build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? In the original drafts of the script, it was actually a time chamber that Doc built out of a refrigerator. And the rules of time travel, Doc had finished this time machine in the 1950s, but he just wasn't able to figure out how to get enough energy to make it work. In the early versions, he actually stole the plutonium from himself, not from terrorists, but from nuclear facility. And he's killed in his lab by federal agents from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission who are trying to get their plutonium back. And uh, Marty hides out from him by going into the time chamber. All kinds of things go to hell, and he ends up back in 1952. So when he's there, the time machine already exists, but how are they going to find the power for it? And Marty is armed with the knowledge about these nuclear test sites, nuclear tests that went on in Nevada. And he's got information from his classroom about this. They actually literally take the time chamber out to this nuclear test site, and they're going to harness the nuclear energy from a bomb blast to send Marty back to the future. That's a and much different movie. I'm amazed yeah, by this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So what turned you around? I mean, like, what? Who, Money. Who or what's, oh, Money like, turned us around. We can't afford a nuclear <laughs> bomb. Yes, we can't afford to go out to the desert and build this town and build this nuclear test site. The budget but came we in. We do have the back lot of Warner Brothers or wherever it is. At Universal, yeah. Universal. Yeah. The budget came in. Universal said, hey, we love the script. We love what you want to do with it. But uh, we're not making this movie until you cut a million dollars out of it. And Bob and I said, well, what are we going to do? The most expensive thing in the movie was bringing the uh, company out the location and building all this stuff out in the desert. We said, well, maybe we can think of something that'll replace that. Does this mean Indiana Jones being in the fridge in a nuclear blast in... Yeah, right from those traps. An homage. <laughs> Bob, part of what we do on the Pizza Film School is we break down, we try to demystify the process for would-be young filmmakers, especially the script writing process. A lot of times people will come up to us and ask us advice about how to get into the business. We always say, write a script. Have a script because it's something you can talk about. It's something you have ownership over. If you want to be a director, then write yourself something to direct. And it's exactly. something you can talk to agents about, you can talk to managers about, you can send it to an executive and you have a conversation with them. But without a script, you don't really have... A yeah. You have nothing. Uh, and when a script written by you on the page is going to look the same as a script written by me, you can do a professional looking job and people will look at it and they will say, oh, okay, it's a script. I know how to read this and react to it. Now, we use a traditional three act structure because over the last decade, working on Winter Soldier and Civil War and Endgame and Infinity War, the four of us have had to sit in a room and talk about the story we want to tell. And what's made it easier for us is when we use mile markers to discuss what the story is about. What are the thematics? What's the plot? Collectively, we have to come to decisions about, well, where does this thing end? And if that's the ending, then where does it start? And then what's our midpoint? What are we turning the story on? What's the key piece of information that comes out at the midpoint or the key character or the key moment that happens that accelerates the character towards the climax? So whenever we talk about movies on Pizza Film School, we break them down by three-act structures so that young filmmakers and young screenwriters can understand how this works so that if they have an idea, they then can kind of look back and go, okay, I know what I want, how I want it to end. So what's my status quo or what's my act one turning point? And it makes it easier for them to accomplish what I think to a lot of people seems like an unaccomplishable task, which is writing a 120 page script and doing it well. I know it took Anthony and I many years before we wrote what I would call a decent script and it took us many scripts. So we're going to break down Back to the Future into a three act structure. You're coming at this from hindsight. 
Yep. It can be kind of easy to impose something on something that already exists. I remember seeing a picture of Stephen Chris standing next to a, a whiteboard or a bulletin board with <laughs> all these scenes yeah. pinned up. And that's yeah. exactly the way Bob and I write. That's how we structured Back to the Future. We didn't do it in chronological order. First, we came <clears> up with certain scenes. It was obvious, okay, if he's going to go back in time, that's a card. And then there's another card. Marty comes back to the future. We said, okay, we want him to invent rock and roll. I can't guess you guys aren't ready for that yet. But your kids are going to love it. That led to another card that said, set up that he wants to play rock and roll. So okay. we knew that where the rock and roll scene had to go generally, and we knew that the other card had to come before he traveled through time. And he invents the skateboard, show that he can skateboard. You know, he interrupts his parents' meeting, he's got to get them together. So we would come up with these scenes that we knew that we wanted to do and started putting them up. And that's how we ended up creating this structure. We weren't thinking about an inciting incident or any of the stuff that's in some of these books. We weren't thinking of an act structure. We were thinking about, we know what the basic story is. We know what the basic two plots are and what are the scenes that we need to make those stories make sense. And you look at a movie like Jaws, how many acts does Jaws have? Two, act one, land, act two, C. You could break any movie down into a two-act structure built around a midpoint, right? Because there are certain films that have more accelerated or impactful midpoints than other movies do. And in a way, you could look at that as the inciting incident because a lot of it is set up, character beginning a journey, and then at a midpoint, there's either you know an encounter with a villain or a new piece of information that is learned that leads you directly to the climax of the film. What I like doing for people, and again, in this demystification process is, listen, if you're having trouble and you have an ending, well, here's a way that you can look at a structure that might help you fill in some pillars to help you get yourself along, like little tent poles in the circus tent that'll help you. Because we all know, as a writer, I find act two very, very difficult. It's, in my mind, the hardest part of the movie to write is because it involves the most obstacles and it's the twists and turns of the film. The status quo is easy to establish. A climax, if you know what your ending is, is, well, how do I make this exciting? But act two is the real heavy lifting, I think, for most films and for most screenwriters and where most amateur screenwriters can get into trouble because you can get lost in act two without you know some lighthouses out there in the distance that you can drive your ship at so i'm a big fan of you know encouraging younger screenwriters and, and filmmakers to understand structure they can throw it all away they can subvert it like the cohen's do it's just instinctual because you have consumed so much content over the, your life that you have a general sense of when something needs to happen in order to move the story forward, either in small dramatic beats or larger dramatic beats. The process works for us because there's four of us. Yeah. And we have to talk about it and debate it and agree on it. No, that's uh, good. Collaboration feel, is great. Yeah, and I feel like if you know, you've know you got a screenwriting partner for a young filmmaker out there, it's easier to talk about things when you can agree upon a moment and you can go, okay, this is the moment we're excited about. Well, I, you know, I don't know as a director if that's the moment I want to tell. Well, as a writer, this is the moment I'm excited about. And then you can kind of mesh those until you get to a place when your collaboration is effective. So we use a traditional three-act structure. Every story starts with a status quo. Where is the character? How are they existing in the world? And what is going to change about their world? Or what do they need to change about their world? So status quo, I think, is more important in Back to the Future than any movie I can think of. Because the essential thesis of the film is to literally reset the status quo by affecting the past. This is why it is such a mind-blowing concept from a screenwriting standpoint. So every story point that's part of the status quo has some payoff somewhere in the film. So it's a masterclass in setup and payoff. So the status quo is Marty and Doc are friends. Marty hangs out with Doc Brown. Doc's been up to something. Marty's in a band. His family's looked upon poorly. He wants a brighter future, wants to go out of town with his girlfriend, wants a pickup truck. You know, so we get sort of the how my life is not as fulfilling as I want it to be status quo, but everything that he wants, he will be able to affect or in some way change. So it's a classic hero's journey in that regard. What if I send in the tape and they don't like it? I mean, what if they say I'm no good? What if they say, get out of here, kid? You got no future. I mean, I just don't think I can take that kind of rejection. His dad is a schmuck. Biff is dominant in the relationship. I can't believe you loaned me a car without telling me it had a blind spot. 
I could have been killed. We get the Uncle Joey set up. His mom and dad's passive existence affects the lives of he and his siblings. So not only is the core essential concept brilliant, but literally every frame of the opening 30 minutes is important to the storytelling of the rest of the movie. That's just great, great screenwriting. That is so economical and intelligent. So let me take you back to the very first sneak preview. And we had an audience in San Jose. All they knew was they were going to see a movie starring Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd. And that was it. And we get to the scene at the mall and we do the thing with the dog in the car and it disappears. Mm -hmm. And there is this very uneasy feeling in the audience. Because they killed the dog. Did they kill that dog? <laughs> that is like the cardinal sin uh, yeah. yes, of the film. You do not kill the dog unless it's John Wick. So the dog comes back and then the audience feels a little bit more comfortable. They learn it's a time machine. Okay, they get a little bit more interested. But the scene where we totally own them was when Michael J. Fox goes into the cafe. Hey, McFly! We see Bip and we see his dad, that great shot that Bob did where you're looking at George in profile and Marty's face just kind of comes around and the audience is just eating it up and they're going crazy. But from that point on, we own them. You own them because they go, wait, why did I wait through 30 minutes? Oh, mm. they oh, got it. Of course. They got I mean, it. It I all mean, came together. Hands. Were you dealing with time travel questions? <laughs> when you... <laughs> there were no time travel questions. Uh. Nobody, nobody in the first movie, we'll talk about the second movie in a minute, nobody in the first movie had any problem understanding the whole idea of time travel, how it was working. There's that really cool cosmic moment where at Lone Pine Mall, when he watches himself and he sees the events that happened earlier in the movie, and that was something the night that we shot that, the crew had all kinds of theories about <laughs> what does this mean, you know? Are well, we violating the rules of physics here? Two objects occupying the same space at the same uh, time, is that? Yeah. Well, um, as we discovered when we were testing Endgame, you created the popular conception of time travel. Every right. audience member's understanding of how time travel should work. If you're yeah, gonna you, try you, to you, get an audience you, to understand that you want to alter time travel rules, it's why we literally had to invoke Back to the Future That's the thing is in the movie at several points so that we yeah, can say yeah. to people, all right, these are different rules of Back to the Future. Right. If you travel to the past, that past becomes your future, and your former present becomes the past, which can't now be changed by your new future. Exactly. So Back to the Future is a bunch of bullshit? You say that, you mean Back to the Future is bullshit? At the end of the day, you guys end up going back into the first Avengers movie and in the earlier Thor movies. So it really is, it really is kind of like yeah. Back to the Future. Oh yeah, Back to the Future 2 was perhaps a, a bigger influence than Back to the Future 1. <laughs> yeah, now, we, Bob, you, you we, brought up a good point earlier that a lot of people don't talk about, which is that a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times characters don't change, right? Captain America doesn't change. Rocky Balboa doesn't change. Marty McFly doesn't change, right? James Bond doesn't change. James Bond know. doesn't change, right? Jane Gary. It's part of what I think they have goals that they want to achieve, and then they achieve the goals. Marty wants a better status quo, and then he goes back in the past, changes it, escapes by the skin of his teeth, and comes back to a better status quo. So he gets what he wants, and it's fun to watch. And he repairs his parents, who you feel bad for in the process, and his brother and his sister. Everybody wins by the end of the movie. It's George McFly is the character who's the pivotal character. He's the guy that makes the character change. Marty McFly is ostensibly the same kid that he was at the beginning of the movie as he is at the end of the movie as he's at the beginning. You know, he's got a truck and he's got a better family life. But in terms of how he's going to behave, he's basically the same guy. The people who change are the people whom he interacts with. And Michael is so charming that that is what is helping me through the film. That's what's helping really from important. the film. He is your guide, mm -hmm. but it's George McFly who makes the life-altering change. He realizes that he just cannot wimp out when he sees the girl that he loves in such danger. He becomes a man at that point when he throws that punch. It is the biggest applause in the movie. <laughs> when it came time for us to do the sequels, we said, well, what are we going to do here? Let's give Marty a character flaw. Nobody calls me chicken. Are you chicken? <laughs> That's it, isn't it? Nothing but a little chicken. And that, of course, gets resolved at the end of the third movie when he throws down his gun at the gunfight. I thought we could settle this like men. 
and we prove it by him refusing to get into the drag race with needles. And he thereby unknowingly changes his own future because he's not going to break his hand in this automobile accident. He's got a much better shot at having a much better future. I would have hit that Rolls Royce. Part of what makes these movies so much fun and entertaining is that you're watching a character that you enjoy try to accomplish a goal. I always say to young filmmakers too, look at one of your favorite movies and look at the structure of it. And how does it inspire you to tell your own story? What story do you want to tell? Is that character changing? Is he not changing? It just depends on what the story is that you're trying to tell. And I think that there's so much plot gymnastics going on in Back to the Future that it doesn't have room for a character who needs to change. It has room for a character who needs to overcome really, really clever obstacles in an incredibly genius high concept. Thank you. So I would say the inciting incident in a traditional three-act structure is thematic or philosophical. He talks with Jennifer about his future. He sets up a date with her, comes home, the car is wrecked. He desperately wants to change his status quo. So that's the inciting incident is that he is intensely unhappy with his status quo. I needed that car no more night, Dad. I mean, do you have any idea how important this was to me? Do you have any clue? Then we traditionally talk about a page 17 moment, Bob, which is something that accelerates you towards exiting the status quo. And traditionally, we say in genre movies, these key moments are plot-based, which you start to get into the core of the film itself. The page 17 moment here is really simple. It's when Doc calls Marty and wakes him up to go to the mall, and Marty slept through this, he would not have exited the status quo. Marty, you didn't fall asleep, did you? Uh, Doc. Uh, no. No, don't, don't be silly. He would not have gotten up, gone to the mall, and gotten stuck in that predicament with Doc when Doc gets attacked. They found me. I don't know how, but they found me. Run for it, Marty! Who? Who? Who do you think? The Libyans! When we get there, Doc shows Marty the DeLorean experiment, explains time travel. I think the best films have a very strong shift from the status quo into the new world of Act Two. They're dramatically different from one another. So the character is leaving something, going to something so dramatically different from where they were that just the geography of it makes the story exciting. And you can't ask for a better shift from the status quo into a new world than being in the present and then going to the past. Because it changes everything around him and potentially traps him there. This is why Michael J. Fox was so critical to the success of the film. He is so charming and winning. You want to see him succeed. So him carrying us through the story and the tension of whether he'll be able, one, be able to change his status quo, two, get back to the world that he left, it's really, a lot of it is on his shoulders, which is so important to cast it. You guys all know the story that we shot five and a half weeks of our movie with Eric Stoltz playing Marty McFly. Had we not been able to replace him with Michael J. Fox, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation today because actors get the big bucks because if they're the right person for the part, you know, much to Marvel's chagrin how much they've had to pay Robert Downey Jr., what he brought to that character is just absolute gold. The movie is also a process of writing and rewriting and rewriting. Every time you have a production problem, for example, Thank goodness we didn't have enough money to make the movie we thought we were going to make. And we had to come up with the clock tower thing as a substitute for the nuclear test site. A much, much better way to do it. And that opening shot where there is so much exposition in that two and a half minute tracking shot, that was added during production because the original opening of the movie was Marty McFly in a classroom learning about these nuclear tests in Nevada and figuring out how he was gonna get out of detention. So we realized, well, we threw away that scene. We don't need that anymore. And we got to save some money because we just jacked up the cost of our movie by having to reshoot the first five weeks that we shot. How can we save some money? Well, let's open the movie in Doc Brown's lab because it's a set that we had standing and uh, we can do it cheaper that way. Having limits on your creativity can make you more creative. Yeah. Well. So Joe, do you want to, okay, end of act one, go back in time. Well, the very clear act one turning point is Marty gets into the DeLorean and goes back in time. We break up act twos into quadrants. Ant and I did this, I think, years ago. Steven Soderbergh discovered us at a film festival, and he said, I want you guys to write a script that, that I can help produce for you to make your next movie. So we had this idea, we're going to write this big, sprawling gangster epic that took place over like three decades in Cleveland, Ohio, in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. We spent three years working on the script and like pulling our hair out. 
because it was so complex. There were 100 speaking parts, probably 25 main characters in it. It followed the uh, Irish mob and the Italian mob and the Jewish mafia, all at war with each other. So it was this big, sprawling, you know, not something that you bite off after you just made a $30,000 micro-budget movie. And part of that process of going insane for three years trying to write that script, we started writing our own rules about structure because we found that it was easier to move the story forward through Act 2, which I think is a slog, in what I call quad. So if act two is 60 pages of story time or 60 minutes of story time and break it up into 15 minute increments and there are many stories that happen in those increments and I think that Back to the Future is an incredible Mm -hmm. example of storytelling in quadrants. You get to the start of act two and you go, okay, I've got a movie about time travel. What are the next 15 pages? Well, the next 15 pages are he's got to realize he's back in the past. He's got to believe that he's back in the past. And then you have to pay off all all the setup of what that means about being back in the past. How is the world different from the world that he lives in? So that's just a bite-sized chunk that as a a screenwriter, you can go, what do I have to do next, right? Well, I've got to set up the world of act two. That's a good increment of 15 pages to look at. So the guys have introduced us to something they call the first pinch, which I just traditionally place between what I call quadrant one and quadrant two. So about 15 minutes into act two, something happens that starts to accelerate the story, either a conflict or first meeting with the villain. So it can be a villain incident, but not necessarily a crisis moment where you're going to die, but you can have a moment where the villain enunciates their agenda and you find out it's in conflict to your agenda. I would say the first pinch of this movie is Marty getting hit by the car. Death! Because that's the first thing that happens that is going to complicate his very existence and for him to get back to the future. That is you know what, Joe, let me, yeah. you So 100%, that's, it's, yeah. a, it's the first candidate. It occurs to me that, like Bob was saying, there are two plots going on basically in Act 2, right? There's the Doc Brown doesn't basically interact with that other plot. It's the, right. it's the science plot is how the hell do I get there Marty home? Much, there isn't much of that plot in Act 2, though. But they, they both have to be triggered, right? right. And, and again, Bob did it really well. They're basically back to back. So Marty gets hit by the car in short order after, you know, the Calvin Klein underwear stuff and all that. He goes to see Doc and shows him the flux capacitor. Flux capacitor. Because that's another huge moment. And he proves to him that I am from the future and I know how you just hit your head. And that triggers Doc into, oh, I'm on this journey now. I am going to take part in this. Yeah. And that's, it's almost like if you have two plots, that's the pinch for that plot. And that's, and well, Marty getting hit by the car. I, I would people. argue that what makes the screenplay so brilliant is what you were talking about, what you do before, Bob, which is you set up obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. So there's an obstacle, then a mini resolution, then another obstacle. And, you know, as you watch the film, it's constantly obstacles thrown in Marty's path and it gets more complicated and complicated until he has to achieve two things. One is stop himself from being wiped from existence because he fucked up and interacted with his mother who now has a crush on him. I think a man should be strong so he can stand up for himself and protect the woman he loves. And two, get back to the future. He can't restore his life unless he leaves the past and goes back to the future, which is, I would argue, the primary story, ultimately, because that's what the movie's called, and that's what the climax is. The clock tower with the plug, Doc, the DeLorean hitting it, and he's able to return to the future. The midpoint of the movie is the idea that they can solve the 1.21 gigawatt problem with the clock tower. This is it. This is the answer. There's like a really interesting piece of score there that sort of tells the audience how important this moment is, but then is immediately followed by the complication, which is, you know, you're going to have to stay here and hide out because you can't mess up the future. And Marty says, I I may have already messed up the future. Great Scott. Let me see that photograph again of your brother. The 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 stakes are introduced there too. The crisis is when he says, let me see that picture again of your brother. You know, you're being erased from existence. His head's gone. It's It's like it's been erased. Erased from existence. That's that moment. 
I, I think they overlap with one another. And we often talk about that you'll find that those issues will cluster around a midpoint. And I studied the midpoint because I was going, okay, what triggers the climax of the film? And I would argue that the climax is Marty getting back to the future. But I would say that it's intrinsically interwoven with the obstacle, which is I fucked up the past. I have to restore it before I can return or I'm going to be wiped out from existence. So I think that's great storytelling is that these two are complementary. And then right. just when you think you've solved the problem, right. there's a new problem. Right. There's a exactly. new problem. It's classic. In the sandwich of the midpoint and the climax, which I think is built around going back to the future, just inside of that is the meat of the Lorraine George problem. You've got the outer story, which is this kid who travels through time and he wants to go home. But then you've got the inner story, which is, oh my God, I've got to get my parents back together. That's right. yeah. And That's right. Doc Brown doesn't really have any interaction with George and Lorraine. He meets Lorraine in that one scene. And the, the stories are actually kind of separate, but you can't finish the outer story without mm -hmm. concluding the inner story. Other thing I wanted to bring up, I was looking at where the act two lowest moment is. And I think, again, Silvestri led me to it. <laughs> the, the saddest score moment in the movie is when Doc Brown tells Marty, I don't want to know about the future. Doc, about the future. No! Marty! We've already agreed that having information about the future could be extremely dangerous. Even if your intentions are good, it can backfire drastically. And Marty realizes that in order to go back to the future, he's going to have to lose Doc Brown, that Doc Brown will forever be, you know, pre going to die. You can't, you can't save him. Damn it, Doc. Why did you have to tear up that letter? I only have more time. Wait a minute. I got all the time I want. I got a time machine. Is This is a love story between Marty and Doc. But what I wanted to point out is that if we decide that the letter is the end of act two and it's Doc sealing his fate, right? So that's an emotional moment. It is slam bang next to the branch breaks. Right, go! And now we have obstacle low moments. We have basically all the mechanics of what is going to occupy the next five minutes of challenges. That's no accident, right? Those things are together for a reason after each of those moments is a critical moment in the secondary story. And the secondary story resolves before the primary story resolves. That's why I would just argue just from a structural standpoint that the primary story has to do with traveling back to the past, traveling back to the future. And then the second story is, oh, you screwed up the future. You have to resolve that before you can go back to the future. Absolutely. That's a necessary byproduct of the story that we chose to tell, mm -hmm. which is you got to straighten out the past before you can go home to the future. And there's plenty of stories that have an A and a B story, and they resolve at the same time or very close to at the same time, because unlike Back to the Future, they're not nested in one another. Well, this is, Bob, been one of the best conversations we've ever had about movies with anyone. We couldn't Thank you. be more grateful that you came on to talk to us about it. This is, as mentioned earlier, a screenplay that we all hold in the highest regard, so thoughtful, clever, and layered, and taught us a lot about how to write movies. And we're very, very grateful for not only supplying us with one of the most entertaining movies of our childhood, but a script that has been incredibly rewarding for us throughout our careers. Well, I always tell aspiring screenwriters to watch the movies of Billy Wilder and Frank Capra. Those movies so often have such a wonderful meld of character and plot. Bob and I learn an awful lot about writing from watching those. I mean, Hitchcock is structure, structure, structure. And uh, when he's lucky enough to have Cary Grant in him, it's better than when he doesn't. Billy Wilder is so consistent and the range that he had that he could do some like it hot, an ace in the hole, same director, my God. The most cynical movie ever made and one of the goofiest movies ever made. What are you talking about? Me and sugar? sugar and sugar. We're just like sisters. Well, I'm your fairy godmother and I'm going to keep an eye on you. Stay tuned next week when Billy Wilder joins us on the <laughs> Rooster Brothers Pizza Film School. <laughs> I want to thank Bob before we go for I Want to Hold Your Hand, which my sisters and I used to watch a lot. And I have no idea why this quote is stuck in my head. I'm not going to do an Eddie Deason impersonation. <laughs> Cheap two plate glass, just like everything else in this flea bag. It's only two eight inch plate glass. These doors are pretty flimsy, like everything else in this flea bag. <laughs>
Yeah, and he had lived that, just like everything else in this week. <laughs> it's a great and perfect finale for Pizza Film School because we've been focusing on structure and story structure. And I think what's important to young filmmakers out there, whether you're going to follow a two-act, a three-act, a five-act, or no structure, find a great story to tell. Find something that is important to you or that entertains you or that you're emotionally connected to and just sit down and just start writing because you're never going to get a script unless you put pen to paper and just force yourself to do it right. every day for a few hours and push your way through the story, however that works, whatever is the best model for you. You need the fridge before you can make the DeLorean. I'm like you guys. I want to know the destination before I turn the keys in my car. Mm -hmm. I want to know where I'm going. I need the ending. I always love that. It's such a personal process. And literally, whoever you are, you can find a way to make it work for yourself. Yeah. No matter how you're built. Your future hasn't been written yet. No one's has. Your future is whatever you make it. So make it a good one. Thank you again, uh, Bob. Okay, Thanks, thank Bob. you guys for having me on. I, oh, cheers. It's a pleasure to meet you all this way, and uh, let's talk in the future and maybe hope do to something together. meet you together, in person huh? one day yeah, when, when we're allowed. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Do I hang up now? All right, I guess I hang up now. Listen, I gotta go, but uh, I wanted to tell you that it's been educational.